Now, please allow me to introduce our first presenter. So, Seth Levy is a PhD and joined uh, Modalis Therapeutics in 2021 as Director of Bioprocess Development to build and oversee internal process development and analytical efforts, as well as manage external manufacturing. Prior to Modalis, um, Seth led led the teams in manufacturing science and technology and small-scale development for AAV and LV manufacturing at Brahma Bio slash Pathion Viral Vector Services. Seth works, worked in gene therapy R&D before his time at a CDMO and drove numerous AAV projects including basic biology research, capsids engineering and translational gene therapy approaches at Sanofi, Genzyme, and academia. Seth was a postdoctoral research fellow at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School after completing his PhD at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Okay, but with that, I'd now like to hand over to our first presenter. So welcome, Seth. Okay, thank you um, for that kind introduction, Marcus. Uh, thanks for everyone for being here today. I understand there's um, a lot of other things distracting uh, during the middle of the workday, so I appreciate people's efforts to be here. Um, as Marcus mentioned, my name is Seth Levy. I'm the Senior Director of Bioprocess Development here at Modalis Therapeutics. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today about the complexities of scaling up novel AAV production. Uh, I'm going to skip the very basic overview of AAV. I think at this point, if you're here today, we've all seen that slide with the rep gene and the cap gene um, and the three VP proteins. I think we can go a little bit deeper than that, hopefully. So to dive right in, I'm going to talk about, you know, why do we need new gene delivery vehicles? The current problem with, um, you know, AVs at the moment is that the current vectors offer limited potency and they have raised safety concerns. So in our mind, the solution is novel AV variants with improved tissue selectivity. You can see the screenshots on the right. We're all familiar with those um, unfortunate headlines with the current vectors. Um, and we think that if we have um, more uh, potent gene delivery vehicles, we can drive more programs through the clinic. So first, I'm going to define novel or engineered caps and variants. Um, for the purpose of this talk as sequence modifications, whether that be point mutations or peptide insertion to naturally occurring serotypes. Novel AV, um, you know, with altered biodistribution can increase the potency, via improved tissue targeting or infectivity or transduction. Uh, they can increase safety kind of on the flip side by reducing off-target tissue infectivity or transduction. And then ultimately that leads to the development of more effective medicines. So we think novel capsids have the potential of lowering vector doses to patients as well as reducing the manufacturing burden, which is clearly going to be um, something you want to consider as you scale up. So now I'm going to show you why Modalis is so interested in novel AV capsids. Here we're looking at um, a parent capsid and four variants of that par parental capsid, um, all expressing GFP in mice. And so the goal here was to look at um, skeletal muscle transduction. So with the gastroc, the quad, the TA, and the diaphragm, depending on the variant, you can see pretty dramatic increases compared to that parent serotype, while also um, significant decreases in the GFP expression in the off-target in the liver. So this was very exciting for us to see. We have recapitulated this data in NHPs with our gene of interest, um, and we're currently using these capsids in multiple programs. So clearly these capsids have the potential to increase safety and efficacy but since they are novel, they do come with a range of manufacturability concerns. Uh, novel AAVs do not always play nicely with established processes and standard technology. For example, lower percentage full. I'll show a few examples of that later. Um, point mutations or peptide insertions can and do alter the capsid structure as well. Yeah, they can lead to reduced binding during affinity chromatography. Variant capsids may not be compatible with commercially available ELISA kits either, which makes in-process testing and early process development challenging, as well as release um, capsid identity testing. So all of this translates to the need for capsid agnostic analytics, as well as increased production um, and purification development, whether that be timeline, resources, um, et cetera. So before I go any further, I will quickly tell you about who Modalis is and our therapeutic approach. We have what we call the CRISPR Gondom platform, so GNDM. It's guide nucleotide directed modulation. We have uh, essentially an enzyme null Cas9 that we can fuse different moieties to uh, to act as a transcription factor. 
So either upregulating or downregulating gene expression. And here we would see in this depiction a transcriptional activator uh, working on a target gene to again specifically activate one gene. So our therapeutic concept is we can fit our mini DCAS9 and our guide RNA into one cassette, uh, and that fits into a single AV. And then for systemic dosing, we would target muscle tissue that leads to the expression of our um, Gondam mRNA, which leads to our Gondam protein, again, acting as a transcription factor to upregulate the gene expression for our target gene and ultimately the therapeutic protein of interest. Okay. Now I'm going to move on to um, analytics as part of the scale-up discussion. So typically for capsid titer early in process development, you would start with an ELISA. And so that's what we're looking at here, the standard curve from a progen ELISA kit, and then the OD values and the, the capsid concentrations in the middle. And now if we think back a couple slides to that parent capsid and the four variants that I showed, uh, this is kind of a case in point that these novel capsids might not play well with established procedures because we know there's capsid in there, um, right? We've put it in vivo. We have orthogonal methods to look at empty full, um, as well as, you know, we've run a VG titer. So we know there's virus, but when we look with the ELISA, we um, are below the LOD for where the capsid titer should be. So there are some ways around this, such as developing ELISA with pan um, serotype antibodies. So what we did early on was uh, we coated streptavidin plates with the biotin AVX poroselect antibody, which is, you know, uh, to act as a capture antibody. And then here we're looking at diluted a sample, or in this case, the progen AVA, I'll say, standard. And then um, also using that AVX antibody, HRP conjugated as detection antibody. So uh, this is kind of a workaround for those off the shelf ELISA's not working. We did see, however, much shorter linear range compared to the progen kits, uh, a much higher LLOD, as well as some accuracy discrepancies. So if we took a known quantity virus and we put it on uh, this assay, it did not necessarily perform as we would expect over time. We also are aware that developing an assay and establishing an assay, even just running it day to day, is also much more labor intensive than these ELISA kits. So um, an ELISA can be developed using affinity and res um, affinity resin antibodies, but qualification and validation might really be challenging. So now I'm going to kind of explain why we care so much about um, capsid titer early on. So here we had a couple runs with a naturally occurring serotype, I'll call it the parent. So we had two runs of that and we understood where the process was. Um, we then had our first run with a triple mutant, so three point mutations and parental capsid. And we saw very similar VG production. So um, we were satisfied with that, but we did want to know, okay, if R&D wants to move this capsid further, um, can we increase, in, increase the production on the PD side? So we then ran a DOE, and then after that DOE, we saw about a five-fold increase in production. So we're very happy with that. Um, of course, the reason we needed to run that DOE is because even though it's only three-point mutations, when we, and we produce similar VGs per mil um, out of upstream, we were getting about a third full particles of what we had before. So significant decrease in um, the packaging efficiency there. So then we ran a DOE to try and increase, again, not just production, but also the full capsids. And we saw um, even further decrease in a percent full. So it really goes to show that it's important to have a broad array of analytics to characterize your AV production. And I would also say that when you're working with these novel capsids, um, it's probably going to be very important to expand on your um, design space running these DOEs. Um, some of your previous experience might not necessarily always apply to these novel capsids. Um, and as I did mention earlier, one of the benefits of ELISA's um, is also characterizing for identity testing. So with the FDA um, CMC guidance and 21 CFR, you need to basically say you made what you said you were going to make. Um, and ELISA's can substitute for that um, in addition to your capsid titer. But if you can't get ELISA's to bind, then of course, or if you need to use a pan-specific or a pan-serotype antibody, like I showed with the AVX resin um, antibody, you know, that's not really going to be specific enough. So we are looking at mass spectrometry as uh, an alternative to ELISA for both titer and identity. They can be costly to develop and qualify. Um, Timelines might be six to eight months if you need to outsource. And then in the literature, there's multiple MS-based technologies to evaluate, LCMS, CEMS, SIPCHIP MS. So there's a lot you need to wade through um, to determine what is best for 
um, your program from a CMC strategy point. So now to kind of move on to the post Eliza world to help us, you know, with the empty full analysis, um, I'll kind of briefly walk you through what we have evaluated and then we can talk more about how we currently do it here at Modalis. So our upstream team relies on caps and titers to help develop production parameters. Um, they would not just determine how much vector we can make, how full that vector can be. Um, transfection DOEs are small in scale. They have a high number of samples and they're too complex of a sample matrix for biophysical measurements. So these challenges may be solved with CAPSID agnostic measurements. Um, again, the first thing we did was DDPCR and ELISA. Um, it has a great detection, it's matrix compatible. Of course, on the downside, there's variability when you're doing a calculation of two different assays. It is CR type specific as I demonstrated and clearly sensitive to mutations. We looked at the stunner, which is high throughput. It's it also gives you DLS. It has a small volume requirement, which is nice. However, it does require purified and concentrated material. Uh, we have looked at the Rayfine photometer, which has good peak separation. Uh, it's a small sample volume. It gives you ambiguous particles, so you can also clearly see um, partials. Um, and then it has a low LOD, which is nice. So while it does require purified material, uh, it does not have to be concentrated kind of end of process levels. We have also, of course, looked at the gold standard uh, AUC, which clearly defines, you know, those empty full and partials. Uh, it does require, of course, purified material and concentrated material. It's a large sample volume. Um, and there has been a patent recently that seems to be um, impacting the data analysis across the industry. So we'll have to see how that plays out as well. Um, and something I'm not going to share any data on today, but I did want to mention that we thought was uh, very interesting was now nanopore sequencing for the identification of partials. Um, it's very cost effective. It's high throughput. It's really great for truncation identification. So if you're early in your process, screening promoters or looking at any genome integrity issues, we think nanopore is really powerful for that. The cons would be that is, you know, there can be some linker dependent artifacts. And we don't think the base calling is as accurate as some of those other NGS options out there. Um, but again, it is really nice for it and any truncation identification hotspots or something. So what we currently have been doing, and for the better part of really almost a year now, has been diving deep with the Rayfine photometer to help all of our empty full analysis. Because as I mentioned, you can do um, not just end of process samples, of course, but upstream and downstream samples um, kind of in process as well. So if you look um, on the top left, you can see an unpurified sample. So this is something that's clarified, um, but has not been through affinity chromatography, for example. Um, and you can see there's really a lot of noise in the chromatogram. Um, with all the host cell proteins and another cell debris that you would expect. So we have developed a small scale purification method here, Modalis, that's kind of quick and efficient for us so that we can take a, an unpurified sample and then clearly get um, empty versus full um, separation in that chromatogram. And then so we can apply this in our upstream DOEs and we can say, okay, condition one, two, and three had you know, 38, 25, and 22% fulls respectively. So it's been very powerful for us to, again, help us determine not just how much we're making, but how full is what we're making. On the downstream side, um, we have the more obvious application, which is for anion exchange chromatography or AEX to help us separate those empty fulls. So if we start with an affinity eluate of 35% full capsids, we run AEX and, you know, if we take that chromatogram into three different peaks or three different fractions, um, we can see, you know, 61% full versus 29 versus 4% full. So um, it's been very, very helpful for us to identify where is the virus, where is the material that we want. Um, so now I'm going to move on to an example of how we employ this knowledge um, to help our process. Here at Modalis, we use iodational ultra centrifugation, not really in a preparative way, but to help us determine um, and develop sample types to put our assays kind of through their paces, if you will. So we have a full fraction, which is 97% full as measured by the photometer, and then the partial fraction, which is 50% full or 47% partials. We then put down our potency assay. And so as you increase MOI here on the X axis, and then you have an increase in your target over housekeeping gene, um, we can see there's no significant difference between something that is 97% full versus 50% full and 47% partial, um, which has been really interesting for us to see, because I think in the literature, there's a lot of um, debate on if you know partials are positive or negative, and here we're seeing they don't seem to be all that negative in our system. 
Uh, we've also done very similar work with empty capsids, spiking in empty capsids into the potency assay. Um, and we saw pretty similar results. You really need to go with a very, very high level of empty capsids before, um, maybe higher than you would expect, before you would really start to see significantly different um, expression profiles in the potency assay. So, you know, it's, it's certainly very interesting um, and it's very helpful to have something like the photometer to um, help us define what our product and our process should look like. So now we're going to transition more to the upstream and downstream side of um, scaling up. So when Modalis first started our PD team around two, two and a half years ago, we first uh, searched for the right cell line, the right media, the right reagents. We ran multiple DOEs comparing cell densities of transfection and transfection reagents, transfection to DNA ratio, plasmid ratios, total DNA, right? The list goes on and on. Um, and then we would confirm those top conditions in bioreactors typically up to a 10 liter scale. So here we would typically run DOEs in about an N of 30, but here I'm just going to show you, you know, just a snippet of one of those DOEs so that you can see the range of VG titer production versus the percent full as measured by the photometer um, as represented by the dots. So you can see that these DOEs really run the gambit of high production and high fulls um, to low production and, you know, low fulls. So that's why it's important to compare in a bioreactor at scale, uh, a representative scale, if you will. And one of the things that we were very interested in, of course, was looking at different transfection reagents because they have different scalability properties. So if you look on the right, we can see reagent one versus reagent two. Uh, reagent two was about five-fold better at producing VG per mil out of upstream, but it came with the cost of a little less than half of the um, percent full compared to reagent one. So the real takeaway here is that you need to understand any trade-offs between production and full particles and then how that works in concert with your downstream purification platform. You know, can you um, rescue something that might have a very low percentage of folds? Or do you want to recover as much virus as possible throughout your process? And, you know, you really want to start with something a little more higher quality that has a higher percent full. So it's really important to not just optimize each unit operation, but how that unit operation is going to impact the rest of those processes as you scale. So, um, Along with that, we also are thinking a lot about the transfection cocktail itself to scale up. So as you move towards, you know, a 200 to 500, maybe even 1,000 liter bioreactors, um, scaling to those larger reactors necessitates some changes in transfection conditions. So the incubation timing of that transfection cocktail, how to reproducibly mix those reagents, how to pump reagents into the reactor, the optimal volume of transfection complex itself, right? It's important to evaluate the volume and addition timing of the transfection cocktail um, as well to understand your scale up feasibility. So if we look at this first graph, um, we have two different volumes. Um, one is recommended from the vendor and then one is just um, an attempt to see how the process looks if we scale up and we want to try and keep some of the um, parameters more manageable that I kind of outlined on the left. So with volume one and volume two, we actually see very similar um, production VG per mil, but with the volume two, we see about a reduction of 50% in the empty full. Um, so that's something that you really want to be aware of because you certainly don't want to scale up your process and say, okay, production was great. And then by the time you figure it out, uh, your empty fulls are half of what they should be. Something else we looked at when considering scale up on the transfection process is the timing of this whole situation. So when we ran our DOEs um, in early process development, we, you know, that Transfection timing and adding to the reactor was one of the things that we've looked at. And we do see, um, you know, differences based on that timing. But with our process, we've been able to have our optimized time plus 20 minutes um, and see very, very similar VG tighter um, and percent full at the 10 liter scale. So we're very excited that um, our transfection reagent that we chose to work with and our plasmids and those complexes seem to be pretty stable for us to scale up to a sizable reactor um, that we need for clinical trial. So, um, you know, that's why, again, it's just important to verify any vec vendor recommended parameters because um, it might be different depending on a lot of confounding factors, your media, your cell line, et cetera. So, to move on to the downstream side of things, just like you compare transfection reagents in upstream, you definitely want to compare um, affinity render vendors um, in downstream and different affinity resins. So here we took the same load material um, and then using serotype specific resin for the same serotype, but from two different vendors, um, we, you know, then 
I tried five different elution buffers to see how it worked across those two resins. And so depending on, you know, the buffer composition you choose and the vendor you work with, you can get some wildly different results, um, right? If you only looked at buffers A and B, you might think vendor two is far superior to vendor one. If you only looked at buffer C, you might say, well, there's nothing from vendor two. Meanwhile, we actually tried this multiple times for vendor two with buffer C, and we just never got anything to elute. So it's very, again, um, important to not just look at the different serotypes, but a wide range of buffers. Because if you chose buffer D, um, you might say, hey, it's pretty comparable between the vendors. So there's a lot of considerations when choosing your affinity resin as well. Another um, consideration when looking at affinity resins that we thought was very interesting for our scale up process is thinking a little bit outside the box for different um, alternative resins. So um, here we had experience with a wild type, if you will, um, kind of parent capsid. And then so when we read um, the downstream process with uh, a variant that had three point mutations on it, we actually saw it behave very differently than our historical data. So we saw a significant amount of virus in the flow through wash the base. So not much material bind. And then our elution was therefore a little bit poor. When we changed some of those loading conditions and elution conditions, we were able to get all the material to bind. Um, however, our elution was still not really where we wanted it to be. However, because we do have a lot of experience working with novel serotypes, um, and we understand that these novel capsids might have the opportunity to be similar to their parent capsids, but they really kind of need to be treated as their own. We tried two different alternative resins um, for different parental serotypes compared to this point mutation. Uh, and even without any optimization at all, um, the elution recoveries were far superior to something that was more specific for that parent capsid. So again, it just kind of goes to show you, um, you need to really evaluate a whole host of range when thinking with these novel AABs. Um, we have done this as well for AEX empty full separation. So obviously resins versus monoliths are going to behave very different, um, give you different profiles in your chromatograms. But even for resin AEX, we've seen very different recoveries and chromatograms between um, different vendors. So it's really going to be very, very vendor specific and very buffer specific for each vendor. So there's a lot to do um, on the downstream side to develop and scale a process um, for novel AAV capsids in our mind. So in conclusions, novel capsid variants have the potential to improve the safety and efficacy profile of AAV vectors. The variant capsids might require um, capsid agnostic analytical approaches such as titer and identification for, for um, empty versus fulls. In addition to the optimal production and quality parameters, the scale-up studies are really necessary to ensure what you see in-house. You know, we can go up to a 50 liter in-house, for example. Um, we got to make sure that can scale to uh, what we need for our clinical trial first in human as well. And then it might require your PD groups to establish capsid agnostic purification platforms to supply R&D groups with vector while simultaneously developing novel purification approaches. Um, if you do use something like ultracentrifugation, in your process, can, if you act as kind of a vector core for R&D, um, you know, you really might hide some of those production issues that we've talked about, such as a very low percentage full. And so if you think about what a scalable platform looks like, um, you might not necessarily have those um, options available to you at large scale. So finally, I will thank um, the team here at Modalis, uh, specifically John Beechill, who runs our analytical development, Farzana Asadi, who runs our upstream team, and Akila Karnik, who runs our downstream team. So with that, I want to thank everybody's attention um, and hand it back to Marcus. Now, please allow me to introduce our next presenter. So Gail Nicholas uh, completed his bachelor's in microbiology and master's in molecular medicine at the University of South Florida, where his research areas were both in uh, chemotherapeutic drug delivery systems and biofilm formation in B. Hensley. Um, he completed his master's in biochemistry, cell and molecular biology at Cornell University in Dr. Pamela Chang's lab, working on characterizing, characterizing the gut microbiome host interaction via metabolomic analysis of bacterial metabolites. Gail joined Refine in January 2021 as a sales and application specialist, where he currently provides support to researchers across the US that are using Refine's groundbreaking technology of mass photometry.
And with that, I'd like to hand over to our next presenter. So welcome, Gail. Thank you, Marcus, and uh, thank you, Seth, for the, the good introductions. Um, I'll just jump right into things. Uh, so as, as Seth sort of outlined in his talk, that there, there is a sort of a need for a quality analytical tool to determine empty full ratios for your AV particles. Um, and a lot of this is necessitated by, you know, high levels of empty particles posing risks to um, the therapeutics. So uh, these can be a result of a, a lot of different reasons, looking at low transduction efficiency for high percentages of empties. Um, these empties also increase immune responses. And, um, you know, it just all around getting these uh, fully purified full fractions is just an expensive process. So looking at how to analyze these, these sorts of biomolecules and what's the right analytical solution, ideally, uh, this, these were questions that Refine sort of asked ourselves when developing like this new tech. And um, so what would the right analytical solution look like, right? You'd, uh, you'd like to have it, um, you know, fast results, high resolution results, um, you know, reliable results, while also uh, cutting down on the cost of, um, you know, just making this therapeutic uh just to do the just to do the analysis right um and so to extend on that uh you'd want low operational cost for this analytical tool but also something that you can apply to all different types of um of your of capsid as as seth outlined modalysis approaches you know these looking at these novel serotypes and novel capsids um and then to be able to apply this to at all different purification stages of your process and so that's sort of what we were getting at when um, you know, we designed um, the SAMX MP. And um, the technology that it's based on is mass photometry. And this is the, the core technology of, of Refine and what we develop here. And I, I'm sort of going to outline exactly how it works here for you. Essentially, it's based on interferometric scattering microscopy. And you can imagine the sample carrier for, for your sample here is looks just like a glass cover slip that's placed on a microscope stage. And what we hone in on actually is uh, if you can imagine a, an AV solution uh, pipetted onto a glass cover slip, you have your AVs floating around in solution and actually uh, they come down and non-specifically adhere to the glass. And so what we care about is at that point of interaction, we can capture the light that a single particle scatters. And then that scattered light actually interferes with the light reflected from the glass. Um, the resulting uh, data that comes out is we get single molecule phase contrast for each AV that can come down and non-specifically adhere to this glass. And this contrast information is directly proportional to the molecule's mass. So um, the end readout essentially for your, for your data is a data histogram showing you um, exactly all of the single molecule counts that were recorded over the one minute recording it takes to do the measurement. And um, that is resolved by mass. So that's how we break down, you know, what is the empty fraction? What is the full fraction? We can differentiate it just because these particles have separate masses. And you can sort of get a hint at the idea of um, with, with this resolution, with this separation, you can detail all of the different populations present in your AV sample, whether it's empty, full, looking at the intermediate and ambiguous partials, or even the overfilled capsids, which I can talk about in a second. So what the tool looks like, um, like I mentioned, it's the SAM XMP. It comes as a manual system, as you see pictured here, or in an automated fashion. And I'll sort of outline the details between, or the differences between the two options later in the presentation. But what we offer is precise empty full ratio within minutes for any ser serotype at minimal operational costs. So you're going to be using low sample volumes and concentrations for this analysis. Um, I can sort of outline what that looks like. It's essentially you'll use on average about 10 microliters of a low E11 capsid per mil solution to do the analysis. Um, and uh, that's like an ideal measurement. We can go slightly lower. We've had success with the E10 range, um, but um, definitely you don't need to heavily purify and concentrate your samples to be able to do this analysis and to know your empty fulls. Um, and on top of that, it comes with an ex easy experimental procedure and a tailored data analysis software, which I'll also uh, detail to you in a second here. But at base, just looking at the performance, um, you so briefly saw an example of what the data looks like and how it can be useful in Seth's presentation. I can sort of outline that um, the SAMX MP performs consistently across the entire empty full range. So in the slide here, what you're seeing is, um, you know, different empty and full uh, 
samples of AV that were mixed together at expected ratios and what the instrument was able to read versus, you know, the expected loading efficiency. And so you see that here in this line that um, it's uh, very linear and it holds out throughout the whole empty full range. And um, these were measured in triplicate, and this was done internally. But when we were developing the SAMICS, we partnered with um, several industry partners to look at its performance. And one on the manual system, Catapult, helped us out with this to look at the reproducibility and precision of the instrument. So here you can see 36 total runs um, right at around the 50% the empty full uh, percentage ratio. Uh, mostly because here's where you, you generally see the most variability with with the numbers but um, even compared to their internal CVs for rep repeatability and precision of um, you know 20 to 20 percent to 30 percent which is you know if you think about it, a little bit uh, a little bit wild that um, that it's this sort of analytical t um, the analytics for this these sorts of samples have CVs of that high but it's really a, a necessity predicates how necessary it is to get a good analysis for these samples. And so with the SAMIX, we have about, you know, 10, 11% for both. Um, and this is the in the manual system. And if I move on here, you can see how that's even more improved using automated measurements. Um, so sort of the difference between the two with the manual and the auto is um, with the manual system, you run about, um, it's the sample measurement time is about a minute and then about another minute to do the processing. Um, in the analysis, uh, and with the automated system, you can run about 24 auto autonomous measurements over the course of an hour and a half. And so you sort of see how the CV is improved, you know, back from the manual system for the SAMICs of allow around 11%, whereas here we have um, about, you know, about 4%. I had mentioned, you know, that uh, especially with uh, a lot of new uh, companies now designing new capsids and new um, new new capsids for these therapeutic targets, we would need something that could perform and measure um, all types of AVs and not really care about what serotype you're looking at. So this is just showing you that the SAMIX is completely serotype agnostic because it is completely just based on the real mass measurement of the sample. And um, just looking at a span of different AV serotypes, you can see here that um, the expected mass measurement you can see it is still quantified accurately. And we had um, you know just a data comparison of CDMS to confirm the mass. Um, this was partnered with Utrecht University to look at that. Um, so really, the, just the bottom line here is that it is serotype agnostic. You can just throw whatever caps that you'd like onto the SAMIX, and you should get accurate mass quantification and then, by extension, accurate quantification of your empties, fulls, and you know intermediate populations. I'll sort of get into exactly, you know, looking at different types of um, populations present in AVs, so or quantifying your heterogeneously filled AVs. Uh, what I have here is a, a couple of replicates off the SAMICS looking at a heterogeneously filled sample. You can sort of see three different populations here where, you know, looking at A, which is likely the empty fraction, B and C, which are two different um, loading events. Um, we can see, these are seen, um, you know, in the industry, a, a lot of different explanations for this. You could have a, a trans gene that's um, maybe a little bit small that gets loaded twice. I have a slide later on um, overfills, and that's what we call those. Or, you know, um, whether or not there's um, uh, a truncation or a partial loading event, you can quantify the intermediates in between all of these peaks. The main the main deal here, though, is that um, the quantification of the empty partial full fraction is comparable with AUC results, which is currently the gold standard for looking at um, these AAVs. Um, just to harp on sort of the difference, though, is you can get the same quality data as an AUC run, but you're going to use a, a lot less sample, and um, the data turnaround is minutes on um, is on the order of minutes versus you know the weeks that it can sometimes take to get AUC results, especially if you're outsourcing your um, your analysis. Honing in on what exactly partials can look like, here you see another resulting mass photometry histogram where we have our empties and fulls separated. And um, looking at the partial fraction, the 
you know, oftentimes these are very hetero, hetero, heterogeneously distributed or in poly disperse. Um, but what we can see here is that um, you can then quantify what's uh, between these two empty and full peaks and confirm that um, you can see streaking of uh, the extracted AAV DNA, which is likely these shorter bands, which are represented in what was loaded into these partials here. Um, and uh, Justin, this this data run j agreed with um, uh, Secmals for for characterizing, you know, the empty full percentage. Whereas, um, you know, getting these intermediary populations are is typically difficult on on a lot of other comparative analytical tools, which is almost necessitates the need for AUC currently. And so here I have a slide just showing what a, a confirmed overfilled event looks like. So you have your empty fraction and then your full fraction based off the transgene size and mass. And then they noticed that um, because it is small enough, you can actually get it loaded twice into your empty capsid and you can then quantify your overfilled fraction as well. Um, realistically, how the software does this is that um, because we are essentially single molecule counting, we can integrate exactly how many counts are present into these ranges, which gives you a sense of, um, you know, you can then compare the count number per, um, per fraction uh, analyzed. So you can set the limits for what's empty, full, and overfilled, and it'll give you the exact proportion of each uh, uh, respective population in, in your sample. And so, you know, I've, I've sort of harped on looking at all of the different fractions present in your AV sample. Now I want to go into exactly where you can use this in your in your preparation. So Seth outlined exactly how Medalis is used this in there, and that's largely um, what we've seen for many of our customers is that uh, currently it's very, very useful um, because we are not going to use just lysate to put on here, but especially in the upstream all the way to downstream, and then you know getting down to end product formulation, um, you, you'd want to get a accurate idea of your empty partial fulls. And so for that, we actually partnered with Farmeron to look at what what stages that you can pop your AV sample onto the SAMICs to get quality data. And so here you see that they could even see results even after clarified lysate. Um, and so this is mostly the empty fraction here, but as you go through after clarification and you start purifying, you can see growing in of the full population. Um, and so what they see here is Aleutian 4 is most enriched for their AV capsids, but the, the main point to look at here is that um, this is really a tool because you don't need to um, in turn concentrate your sample and have a have a fairly concentrated or pure sample to do the analysis you can be purifying your AVs and uh, quickly take just a small fraction of relative of different elutions pop it on the instrument and in about two minutes you'll have a fully resolved mass histogram of your sample detailing all of your you, you know your proportions for your full percentage exactly um, and so this this is you can sort of get an idea of how this could be used to optimize both your process um, to make key decision points, especially upstream in your process, so you're not wasting valuable time and money producing producing a prep that's maybe not be ideal. And so on top of that, looking at where in your process and what information is available to you using the Samix, you can look at all of these different steps. But in addition to empty partial full. We offer, we offer a tidying, tidying solution as well. Um, and this is mostly coming from the idea that um, in a mass photometry movie, we are essentially counting particles. And um, the, the amount of particles you see in, in the movie is, is correlative with the concentration of the sample. And so what, when you use um, your AV sample in the ideal range for the mass photometer, which is around the low E11 capsid per mil concentration, we are able to titer uh, the sample. And so you hear, see here uh, five replicates of an AV8 sample, um, and you can see the precision and the deviation of about uh, of these five replicates. It's um, on the order of two E10 for that this E11 sample essentially, and that these agreed with Eliza. I have um, so this was done on the manual system. I also have data looking at um, you know titering on both the SAMICs and the automated system, and here looking at uh, different serotypes. Um, this is uh, obviously of, of the advantage because you don't need to then uh, have a different titering application for each every for each serotype that you'd like to test. This is also a serotype agnostic um, tool. So what you see here is that the rough titer 
estimations with a, within the right order of magnitude and agrees with the ELISA data. And then this tighter prediction is also linear within the applicable concentration range for the instrument. So far, this tighter estimation tool has been limited to purified AVs so far, but we have a lot of customers um, coming to us saying that uh, this, this tool has been uh, pretty invaluable for, for making assessments on their process as well as, as well as the utility and ease of getting this data. Um, uh, and just to mention again, yeah, it's um, for, for this, if you have more concentrated samples, you would just then dilute to the low E11 range for your, for your analysis. So this is getting in on titering. We can also give insights into AV aggregation. And so what that looks like here is, um, like I mentioned, it is a single molecule technique. So we are able to pick up on even low abundance populations present in the sample. Um, and so in the histogram that you see here, this is an artificially aggregated sample that was done by drying and reconstituting AV8 capsids. Um, and you can see our you know, single peak of empty AVs here. And then if we go by mass, as we you know, double the mass, we can see two AVs and even three AVs. And um, this is all just resolved by, by, by the mass that you can then integrate and quantify as a percentage of solution. And so what's important to, to notice here is that um, I say we can give insights into AV aggregation because the SAMIX does have an upper size limit. Um, and so you can qualitatively assess that there are aggregates further out past, you know, the dimer or trimer of AV here. Um, but at some point between, you know, uh, higher than two to three AVs, uh, we lose quantification because uh, essentially these aggregates are, are getting too large. But um, it does give you qualitatively, it does give you a qualitative assessment on whether or not um, your, your sample is aggregating. And looking at the movie can tell you exactly how, how bad that could be. Um, so I, I sort of want to give a summary of how the SAMICS works and, you know, break down like the ac actual experiment and what, what you could expect. Um, so the important thing to notice here is that this, there's limited sample preparation for, for the SAMICS. You, um, you're pretty uh, flexible with what buffers you can run on here, and it's a label-free measurement um, in the native state, importantly. And so with that, you get fast results. I, I mentioned it's about one minute to do the measurement and record your sample, and then to process it to get your data histogram fully mass resolved with you know, your peaks fit and your empty partial fulls uh, counted, it's uh, another minute. So less than five minutes per measurement, including the analysis. Um, you're having low sample amounts, so it's about 10 to 20 microliters of a low E11 capsid per mil solution, and it's uh, fairly easy to use and takes up um, very little real estate. So um, I myself have trained people on here. It takes about two to three hours to become proficient on the instrument, and the data analysis is intuitive, and it'll fit on your bench top. All after that, it's um, less, you know, less than $5 per measurement, um, so low operational cost for the instrument as well. So, um, you know, that's like the analysis, right? I can, I also want to provide some information on um, the dedicated software and, and user inf interface for our software, as well as some new things that we have recently launched that um, um, you might not have heard of. So, um, like I mentioned, you have a dedicated software to, for the analysis that, which is realistically the characterization of these histograms, um, which can then um, easily integrate and, and give out to you both the tighter information, but also your empty partial full uh, proportions. And then along with that, you have dedicated consumables for, um, for the mass photometry experiment. So here you, you can source these from us, um, but it's the same low cost cover slips that, that I've mentioned, which um, run you about less than $5 per measurement. And so some of the, um, the latest and, and greatest from the SAMX MP is that uh, previously we could only offer um, this tool to be used in you know, these upstream and downstream um, environments uh, or AD, but um, not on to your QC and release stages. Now we offer GMP regulated software, 21 CFR compliant software for um, easy data, data integrity and traceability. And so that now can allows you to place these SAMXs in, um, you know, release, release and QC labs. Um, and so I'll sort of detail to you a little bit about what we offer here. Um, the package is called Refine Manage MP, which allows you to manage your user authentication and um, access control 
gives you um, you know easily audit but uh, an audit audit trail that's easy, easily visualized and also define the configuration for you know your team. And so that comes with the Refine Acquire MP acquisition software, which is our you know our normal acquisition software. But then the Evaluate MP um, allows you to easily determine your AV ratios for your empty partial fulls and also export data um, with with signatures. And so this is um, you know typical of like any. 21 CFR compliant software, you'll get um, access to user management and access control that you can then, um, you know, as an admin, you would then set for your team exactly how you'd like this structured. Um, there's a lot of flexibility with how, how you'd like to do that. And then with that, you get your audit trail that's automatically generated um, that can, can't be modified, easily exportable, and then also searchable. So you can also, um, you know, it's not too much of a headache to go back to see exactly what was ran for a particular sample. And then so with this GMP software on the analysis side, it gives you an automatic work, automated workflow for quantification of your ratios. Um, so as, as you see here, you sort of have an example of easy determination of empty partial full. So for an all, already pretty intuitive you know, data analysis platform, now you have um, automated fitting of uh, all of these peaks so, um, and as well as fitting of your calibrant samples to then be able to detect um, exactly what your empty partial full is for reproducibility um, in like this QC environment. Um, and then finally, you know, you're going to have your data export. And so that's all comes with your electronic si signatures. It's easy to export. And um, that's also all recorded on your audit trail. Um, but, you know, questions on GMP, this is obviously tailored uh, specific to each, each group. Um, and, you know, more things on that, we can obviously talk and uh, follow up later. And so to end the talk, I just wanted to sh uh, just show a slide of the um, mass photometry family. Um, we have um, the SAMX MP, which I've outlined for you here, which is optimized for AV characterization, but Refine off also offers solution solutions for uh, many other biological biological molecules um, like biologics and um, the 2MP is also part of the system and I, I'd be happy to detail that uh, later if, he, if after this presentation as well but I'd be happy to um, pass it back to Marcus here um, thanks for the introduction thanks for your time everyone and um, it would be great to answer some questions Hello everyone, welcome to today's webinar titled Navigating Complexities of AAV Scale-Up to Keep Pace with the Increasing Demands for These Viral Vector Delivery Systems. Hosted by Biopharma Webinars and presented by Seth Levy, who's Director of Bioprocess Development at Modalis Therapeutics. So Seth, hello there, welcome, thank you for joining us today, it's a pleasure to have you. Okay, and joining us today we also have a presentation um, by Gail Nicholas, Senior Technical Sales Specialist at Refine. And this presentation will be titled Streamlining AAV Characterization with Mass Photometry.